Um, hey, thank you for the, the wonderful introduction. Um, I think um, uh, I will uh, sort of speak up uh, for Liz as well. And we don't pay each other to compliment each other, but um, my first interaction with Liz was um, on, on a call and uh, she was giving a little overview of uh, what she was talking about around vaccine confidence and demand. And um, it was one of the first times that after probably five to seven years of beating the drum of talking about how people build trust in vaccines and in systems and the importance of getting the system right, um, that uh, finally there was someone else out in the woods uh, after yelling into the darkness for years um, who was saying the same thing. Um, so it was really uh, exciting. It, it was uh, a really good opportunity to just kind of say, good, we, we have, uh, we're coalescing um, around our strategy and, and our focus and thinking about uh, and understanding how you build trust in a vaccine, particularly in a new product. Um, and in a situation where people are under a lot of stress um, and are in a, a state of, of trauma and had been uh, for close to a year uh, and we're getting a lot of information, overwhelmed with information um, and how we had to, it wasn't just about the vaccine, it was about trust in the system over time um, and how we built that now will, will play an amazing, a huge role in how we are able to move forward. And if we messed it up, uh, we could completely dismantle trust in immunizations overall. Um, and so coming in it from that point of view and having others uh, coming into the, the vaccine task force and the vaccine work that we were doing um, and being able to kind of coalesce around that was incredibly uh, helpful. Um, and having, again, somebody from another part of the agency uh, come in and say something that you've been beating the drums about for years um, is always really, really helpful um, because it does allow that, um, uh, that opportunity to build uh, internally as well. So, all right, lengthy introduction. Um, so common sense, everyday approach to infodemic management. The, the CERC, um, what is CERC? It's crisis emergency risk communication. When we talk about it at CDC, um, we talk about it sort of in this very, um, very sort of communication, almost mass communication centralized role. Um, but our previous presenter, I think really kind of gave uh, an important part of this which is that it doesn't matter sometimes what you say if the person saying it isn't trusted. So as we talk about CERC and as we talk about the principles and the work that we do, it's not just about what we say, it's how we empower others to say similar things as well um, and understand the information and the content and the context um, so that they can share it with the people who, they, who trust them uh, and uh, the people in their sort of connected information group. Um, so in a crisis, we, we do think about information differently. We, we take in information differently, we process it differently, and then we act on it differently. We, um, and, and when our brains are under stress, um, we, we need, uh, we tend to simplify things. Uh, we get into our um, uh, fight or flight brain, um, and so we don't have the capacity to take in complicated information. It's harder for us to um, process um, nuance. Um, so we need things that are simple um, and we need to limit the amount of information that we're getting at one time. We really need to chunk it out uh, and get bits and bits of information and repeat it, uh, knowing uh, that you know, you, we may have said something and we think, oh, everybody understands it. Well, as we're dealing with sort of different points of crisis um, and uh, the vaccine rollout to different age groups and different uh, communities and populations, a really good way to think about it. Um, we've been thinking about something like this for a long time. Um, I started working on the vaccine rollout in March of last year. Um, and so the vaccine first came out to healthcare providers and, and um, long-term care facility folks 
um, at the end of December, so a year ago. There's a lot that I had the chance and, and those of us uh, in the professional setting had the chance to learn uh, and process over that time. And so what our responsibility is as communicators, as epidemic managers, as simply public servants um, is to take that information and be able to share it um, with people who are, are in our communities um, and give it to them again and again. It will be new to them. So I've been hearing about this and thinking about this for a very long time, um, whereas uh, a parent of a uh, five-year-old um, who now is able to get uh, their child vaccinated now is thinking about their child being vaccinated. We've been thinking about children being vaccinated for a while. They're just now processing it because they've been dealing with the stress and the trauma of kids being out of school and how do I work and take care of my child at the same time. And so their hierarchy of needs uh, is preventing them from absorbing new information. So we have to really kind of be patient with that. Um, and in that process, um, change is really hard. Um, change is hard uh, when everything is secure and stable and we're comfortable and we can deal with uh, bits of information, but big change at one time um, is really difficult. Um, we found in the, the United States um, that in many communities, um, in order to deal with change, the psychology of change um, and the psychology of a changing world, um, people's faith and their connections to their religions are really uh, absolutely important. And in some communities where there's a large religious population, um, the communities really had a hard time listening to public health because we just took away their comfort, uh, their current beliefs, their, their system uh, of control and how they process information. We took that away because we had to close down the, the churches uh, and go virtual uh, because we didn't want to spread the disease. Um, and that was a really difficult, challenging thing for a lot of people. They took that very personally um, and because we were taking away something um, and they, they were not able to process even the risk that they had of going into the building um, and singing and uh, being in a place where you're going to spread germs and uh, possibly put yourself at risk. Even at the same time as they knew that there were people in their congregations um, and in their faith communities who were dying uh, from the illness that they were putting at risk. So again, clinging to these current beliefs, uh, we have to sort of know that people are going from that place. Um, and we have to learn from our previous experience that the point about everything being iterative um, is not just sort of uh, with one particular product at one particular time. It is everything. We are the sum of our experiences. Um, and hopefully the sum of experience um, that, that others have had that are sharing with us. Um, I had the chance to learn from a lot of uh, people um, in public health uh, throughout my career. Um, I know all of us um, hopefully we'll have that chance or have had that chance as well. Um, and so we're the sum of that experience. We have to see what worked and what didn't work and really be honest with that as we move forward uh, and take that into account. Um, and uh, people are going to look for additional information or, or, or opinions. And this idea of new novel information uh, in a constantly changing situation and uh, is really powerful on social media. There are studies that show um, that um, when someone shares something that's new, it might not be right, but it seems like it could be right. Um, there's a lot of praise that goes with it. Like, oh, look, th this person um, has shared new information. Look, that answers a question that, that was bothering me that we hadn't answered before. It spreads really rapidly. Um, and it spreads really rapidly on social media. We see it, we're able to track it, but Guess what? It spread like that in rumor mills as well. Um, the, the idea of, of family sitting around the kitchen table, talking to neighbors, information sharing. We've all played that old game of telephone uh, where we sit down and we talk in a room and somebody has a statement. And then by the, the time that 30 people have said it, it's completely different by the end of the line. That works. Uh, that's almost that that's always been there. That's part of how we are as people. Um, we saw that really kind of explode with the, even the invention of the printing press and being able to spread uh, inaccurate information and leaflets everywhere. But oh, look, it seems right. Or I heard that and I saw that and I, I, I understand it. Um, 
And uh, the faster information spreads, the faster inaccurate information spreads as well. Um, so we just know that all of this is part of uh, enhancing what we already have under human nature. Um, so if, if you go to a uh, community like an Amish community in the United States where they are disconnected from technology in many ways um, because of their religious faith and, and also their distrusting of outsiders, um, they're uh, going to be looking for additional information from different people. So if you have a more traditional uh, environment or background, um, people are going to revert to the things that they trust and know. Uh, they're not going to come in and listen to, well, I don't know you. You are a health professional. I've never seen you before. Uh, you're a person of science. I'm a person of faith. Um, and I, I don't like what you're telling me to do. Um, and so you're going to revert to those current beliefs, but you're going to look for additional information and opinions based on those current beliefs. Uh, the last thing I think is, is really important is that your brain doesn't necessarily um, sort of get into this big mass hysterical panic. Um, I think this is a really important myth to kind of understand. Um, sure, uh, individuals don't panic. Uh, groups can get together and there's a lot of energy uh, that can come from that. There's sort of a group think um, and something can get out of control or individuals can make bad decisions in those situations. And then there's sort of this... Uh, uh, snowballing effect of peer pressure that can come with that, but often individuals do not really panic. They sort of get overwhelmed um, and they want help. They want uh, people to kind of help walk them through that path to get them out of that traumatic, difficult, challenging situation. Um, and that's what we can do um, in public health. That's what we can do as epidemic managers. That's what we can do um, as communications uh, people, as outreach workers, and again, just as human beings. Um, the so under stress, uh, people, um, the psychological barriers to messages in our messengers. This is really important. Um, the messengers piece, um, again, the previous uh, presentation talked a lot about the outreach component of it. Um, we have great messages, messages. Uh, we spend a lot of time getting them right, we spend a lot of time getting uh, an energy, getting the science and the epidemiology correct. Um, we think about how we're communicating them uh, and framing them for the, the people who we are trying to reach. Um, but if the messenger is not trusted, um, um, then it doesn't matter. Um, and, uh, and people were, were, are, are already in a sense of um, denial. Um, they don't want to believe what's going on. Um, we saw this. We see this a lot. Um, we talked about sort of denial denial of the fact that the pandemic even exists, like, oh, it's just the cold, people are getting sick more, um, whatever, you know, older people die, it's fine, like, it, you justify it so that you can kind of go on and be stable in your regular life, um, and all of that kind of, there's uh, fear and anxiety, confusion, dread that's at the core of that, um, and the last thing that people want is hopelessness or helplessness, and depending on kind of people's different personalities, they manifest, some may manifest helplessness and then they react and push out from that. And we see a lot of that in um, uh, some of the, the vaccine denial and some of the, um, and one of the challenges when we are thinking about something like uh, getting vaccines out there uh, and setting mandates is that oftentimes uh, the more we push, the more people will push back just to get a little bit of control so that they don't feel helpless. We're, we're starting out in a situation uh, in a pandemic where people do feel helpless. Um, and in any situation, oftentimes, um, and when they do feel helpless, you're, you're often tapping a, a core helplessness that they feel uh, in many situations. And you have us um, who are often seen as uh, outsiders, know-it-alls, look, oh, we, we have so much, uh, we talk differently, we look different. Um, and uh, they, they may not absorb the information. Um, and then people who are hopeless, you, you get into this almost this uh, nihilism um, where, well, you know, what can I do? Uh, this is too big, I can't do anything. Um, and so, you know, you want to, there's a, a switch that has to happen in, in, in doing the CERT work and in being a communicator and in being in public health that has to flip it um, so that we give people empowerment um, and hope uh, that they can uh, affect uh, change 
individually um, over time and create community um, to facilitate that change uh, across larger groups. Um, and so risk communication, we seek to uh, address these issues um, by creating and maintaining trust. Um, so uh, we'll get, when we get to the principles, we'll talk about that. Um, uh, talk about another piece of this or how that relates. Uh, we need to acknowledge and communicate um, even in uncertainty. If we don't know um, and are clear that we don't know um, and that we are working on and trying to find the answer, that helps mitigate this information gap. If we're honest about what we don't know uh, and we're clear about it, uh, that prevents sort of false experts coming in um, and uh, usurping uh, in, into that open space uh, and uh, filling it up. Uh, coordinating is really important. This gets to the multiple messengers. Um, so there are some messages and some content, uh, for example, that me as a, a public health government, public health official uh, cannot deliver uh, to individuals, uh, particularly as a, as a male uh, government official, it's very difficult uh, for um, a woman of childbearing age to hear me talk about how vaccines will not affect your fertility. Um, and fertility is an issue that is, uh, it's come up multiple times, uh, sort of a sustained uh, issue that, but it often has to do with values and people's roles in society. Um, so a role of a parent or a mother um, is incredibly important. Um, and many, uh, many women, many individuals, many families um, know or have experienced some kind of infertility um, in their life. And so coming from me um, to uh, talking about a very personal issue is not necessarily going to be effective. Um, however, um, a faith leader coming in and saying, you need to protect your family by getting the vaccine. You need to protect yourself. If you become sick, if you, uh, if you die, you cannot have children. So get the vaccine, it's incredibly important. That becomes meaningful. Um, and so we have to coordinate with our different messengers across multiple areas um, in order to get those messages out um, and know that they're going to deliver them in their language, in their tone, from their point of view. Um, being transparent, Parent and fast um, and being the first in all the communications, um, knowing that, that sort of we in public health um, have a, an important role to play in understanding things, getting the science right. Um, I think this is incredibly challenging. This is getting harder and harder and harder um, because in public health, we tend to work from this point of view of proven science drives what we do. Um, and so we, we, when we are implementing programs and we are doing work, we're going back to proven science. Um, and and there, there's um, concepts of accountability uh, that really kind of fit into that. Um, but in an emergency situation, uh, we have to know that it's emergent. Um, it is changing all the time. There is not something that is absolutely proven. Um, and we have to, if there, uh, one, of, one of the things that we faced quite a bit during uh, the early phases of the pandemic, um, is that we had algorithms uh, and data sources um, that were giving us uh, syndromic uh, kinds of views of case numbers uh, that we at the national level didn't have the capacity to be able to process uh, coming from different sources. And so how do we bring that into our system um, in order, uh, how do we, one, make sure that it's accurate? Um, and two, how do we bring that in if it is accurate uh, as part of our system and, and coordinate around those areas. Um, and we have to be proactive in our, our communication. Um, th this, is gonna, this theme is going to come up again, this being first, being out there uh, ahead of time, not waiting for something. This is where you get into that idea of uh, pre-bunking. Um, and we have to involve and engage those affected. Again, this creates empowerment um, and using lots of integrated approaches. Talked about not only something being on the web, something being printed, something being uh, sort of injected into the rumor mill. Um, we have to get, uh, look at all the ways people interact with information uh, in order to get information out. Um, and in that process, um, we also have to listen um, and uh, build the sort of national capacity and make sure that we are um, moving, again, this is from a CDC point of view, 
Um, and as we're doing this, um, we have a lot of epidemiologic capacity. We have a lot of um, uh, programmatic capacity. Um, but one of the things that is really challenging about public health um, and the science of epidemiology is that it's really good at pointing out the problems. Um, and then what we do in communication, sharing the information to empower people to take action um, is not always part of the, the first step of epidemiology. So we have to go from the diagnosis of the problem to the explanation of the problem to the solution of the problem um, and creating that, that national system to be able to do that and a fully integrated public health system to be able to do that um, is really challenging and at the core of uh, risk communication. So um, first, the, the six principles of CERP to go in and address that. Be first, be right, be credible, express empathy, promote action, and show respect. Um, so it, as you look at all of these, sort of take a second and, and take these ideas in. Um, we saw bits and pieces of these ideas in the previous presentations, right? Um, getting your information out doesn't have to be perfect. The, the perfect is the enemy of action. Um, I'm gonna use that now from now on. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, um, looking at it from that action point of view um, and integrating all of these things. This is not a, one of the things about CERC and one of the things about communication um, and one of the things about public health is it's not an end state. You, we, we, what we often do um, where, we, where we come into challenges with CERC, uh, when we come into challenges with our communication principles is we do this once um, or we do this in one setting, right? So, wow, look, we did a really great um, media briefing and the spokespeople did all of these things. Well, not everyone's listening to the media briefing um, and the reporters who are listening to it, maybe they reported, um, but there are others out there that we're missing. So making sure that we're, we're doing this uh, ongoing with all of our resources, with all of our trust messengers um, and with all of our outlets um, is really challenging, uh, but also absolutely critical. Um, and, and with science information in particular, it's, it's particularly difficult because um, we have a situation where uh, science takes a long time to really kind of um, become a uh, filter into society. Um, so, you know, you start out with the science folks, you can often go down to the clinical um, and then down into the different clinical settings um, and, and you're sort of dealing with different levels of education and knowledge. Uh, um, and in order to do that, uh, in order for it to really become widespread and common, uh, it, it, it can be challenging because you, as science changes, you do have to keep up with that and make sure that people are getting all of these things. So um, with information that's changing all the time, um, having that ongoing, uh, being first, being right, being credible, expressing empathy, knowing that people are going through um, real challenges, uh, knowing that people can take action and showing respect that taking action, the last three are absolutely important because they allow for people to move out of that helplessness and hopelessness um, so that they can hear the message. Um, so the more that you create that trust, the more that you build relationships, um, building that trust and rapport, showing our humanity, um, is absolutely at the core of all of this. If we show our humanity, uh, trusted messengers will hear from us and they will then share that information. They will model that humanity um, as well. 